Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Rochelle Waterman? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I will look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, and offer my analysis. This case takes place in Craig, Alaska. This small town on Prince of Wales Island is home to about 1,000 people. Doc and Lori Waterman were a married couple who lived in Craig. They met in Utah and moved to Alaska. They had two children, Rochelle and Jeffrey. Doc was a real estate agent. Lori was a special education teacher aide. During the summer of 2003, before Rochelle started her junior year in high school, she was offered a job at a computer store. Rochelle became friends with a 25-year-old co-worker named Brian Riddell. She started dating a friend of his, a 25-year-old janitor named Jason Arant. Rochelle turned 16 in August of 2003. The age difference was concerning to Rochelle's parents. Rochelle did not seem to care. She started dressing in all black and became defiant to her parents. Before moving to the timeline of the crime, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Upside. From cringing at the pump to getting a devastating check at your favorite restaurant, inflation is hitting us all where it hurts. That's why I started using Upside. Upside is an incredible app for anyone who buys gas, groceries, or dines out. With every purchase, I'm earning cash back thanks to Upside. I use Upside to fuel my truck and to buy groceries. The app is extremely easy to use and really convenient. It may seem like Upside is too good to be true, but it's not. It really works. Upside is a no-brainer. To get started with Upside, download the free Upside app in the App Store or Google Play, use my promotion code Dr. Grande, and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Next, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside, check in at the business, pay as usual with a credit card or debit card, and get paid. You can earn three times more cash back with Upside as compared to credit card rewards or loyalty programs. You can cash out at any time to your bank account, PayPal, or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars every week. That's probably one reason Upside has a 4.8 star rating on the App Store. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On Sunday, November 14, 2004, Brian Riddell, again this is Rochelle's friend from the computer store, made his way to the Waterman family residence. Lori, Rochelle's mother, was there alone after returning from a dinner at the Chamber of Commerce. Brian broke into the residence and threatened Lori. He tied her up with a synthetic rope and forced her to drink wine. He then put her into the back seat of her own vehicle, a Chrysler minivan. Brian drove Lori to a rural area where Jason met him in another vehicle. They wanted to kill Lori and make it look like a motor vehicle collision. Brian pulled Lori out of the vehicle and tried to break her neck, but he was not successful. He ended up suffocating her instead. Brian and Jason drove to another area and set her minivan on fire. The Alaska State Police received a call indicating a hunter found a burning vehicle on a logging road. When the police arrived, the vehicle was still smoldering. They could see human bones in the back seat. That night, the police received a call from Lori Waterman's husband, Doc, indicating that she was missing. Her Chrysler minivan was missing as well. Here's what the police found during their investigation. All the members of the Waterman family had alibis. Doc Waterman had been in Juneau, Alaska during the time his wife went missing. His daughter, Rochelle, had been in a volleyball tournament in Anchorage. And his son, Jeffrey, was attending college in another state. A bottle of wine had been left out in the Waterman family home, which seemed unusual because Lori did not drink. There was a footprint on the windowsill. Fibers from a synthetic rope were found in the bathroom. The bed was not made, which was out of the ordinary for Lori. Bloodstains were found on the sheets, and a tip of a rubber glove was discovered in the bedroom. The police first suspected Lori's husband, like perhaps he hired someone to kill her. But after checking his cell phone records and financial records, they didn't find anything connecting him to the murder. 
The police then interviewed Rochelle's boyfriend, Jason. He said that he was with Brian Riddell the night of the murder. They had watched the 1987 movie The Princess Bride repeatedly. I'm guessing there's not a whole lot to do in Craig, Alaska, therefore his alibi was probably considered reasonable. The difficulty was that Brian's story didn't quite match Jason's account of a Princess Bride-fueled extravaganza. The police decided that the alibi was inconceivable. The day after being interviewed, Jason called the police and said that he was in a parking lot when a man wearing a black hood attacked him. The mysterious assailant told him to stay away from Rochelle. Jason had a scratch on his throat to prove his story. The police said that it was self-inflicted. They interviewed Jason again, telling him that they didn't believe he was attacked, and they thought that he murdered Lori Waterman. Jason admitted to being involved in the murder, but said that Brian Riddell was the one who broke into the Waterman house. Jason and Brian murdered Lori in order to protect Rochelle from physical harm. Jason agreed to wear a listening device. He spoke to Brian, and during their conversation, Brian implicated himself in the murder. The police interviewed Brian. He admitted to killing Lori. He said that he planned to kill Lori earlier using a firearm, but when he went to carry out the murder, he forgot to bring the cartridges. Rochelle was interviewed by the police. She denied any involvement, but then made several admissions. A few examples. She brought up the idea of killing her mother to Jason and Brian. They offered to commit the murder, but Rochelle was not serious and did not want it done. She said, I remember me saying, like, no, don't do it. Investigators noted that Rochelle must not have opposed the plan too much. She responded by saying, well, maybe I should never be on the debate team. Rochelle admitted that Jason told her Brian was planning on shooting her mother. Rochelle told the men when her father was going to be away from the house, but she claimed it was part of a casual conversation. Rochelle admitted that she was pretty sure the men might try to kill her mother that weekend. Initially, Rochelle said that she called the men from Anchorage and told them not to do it, but later she admitted that she had not told them she had changed her mind. In addition to her numerous admissions, Rochelle also had a lot of stories about how her mother had mistreated her. She claimed that her mother once hit her with a baseball bat and on another occasion pushed her downstairs. Eventually, Rochelle admitted that she was lying about those stories. Brian was arrested on November 18. Jason and Rochelle were arrested on November 19. In June 2005, Brian pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 99 years in prison. Jason was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Rochelle decided to go to trial, which started in January 2006. Her confession was ruled inadmissible. The jury could not reach a unanimous decision, and a mistrial was declared. She was tried again in 2011 and convicted of criminally negligent homicide. She was sentenced to three years in prison. After Rochelle was released, she did not return to Alaska. Now moving to my analysis. Was Rochelle Waterman actually guilty of murder? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that she was guilty, starting with the inculpatory evidence. Rochelle admitted that she knew Jason and Brian were going to kill her mother when she was away, but again, the jury never heard this evidence. Jason and Brian both said that Rochelle was the mastermind. Rochelle maintained a blog where she described Craig, Alaska as hell. She felt alone and wanted adventure. Rochelle was rebelling during the time when her mother was killed. She initially lied to the police about having sex with Jason. The day after her mother's remains were discovered, Rochelle went to school. She was giggling at one point. She told her friends that her mother probably became intoxicated and drove off of the road. This is the same story that Jason and Brian were trying to fabricate. The police asked Rochelle to wear a listening device to trap Jason and Brian. She refused. Moving to the exculpatory factors, Rochelle was definitely not physically present when her mother was killed. Jason was considered to be physically unattractive. He was desperate to have sex with Rochelle and viewed her mother as interfering. He may have interpreted Rochelle's displeasure with her mother as an invitation to commit murder, or he may not have understood that Rochelle was speaking figuratively when talking about wanting her mother dead. Some of Rochelle's admissions to the police may have been made out of fear or confusion, 
and not because she was actually guilty. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Rochelle was guilty? Yes, I think she was guilty in reality, but without the confession, she was not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Jason and Brian were not reliable witnesses and had a clear motive for lying. I think the state was fortunate to get the conviction for criminally negligent homicide. Moving to my conceptualization of this case, what do I think happened here? This is just a theory, my opinion. Craig, Alaska is a small town that is extremely isolated. There is not much to do there, and there are limited options for romantic partnerships. Rochelle was struggling with boredom and wanted to strike out against her mother. Therefore, she entered into a romantic relationship with an unattractive and desperate partner. Rochelle talked about eliminating her mother, but she wasn't too serious when she first introduced the topic. Jason, however, liked the idea quite a bit, but he did not feel capable of carrying out the murder himself. He recruited Brian Riddell to help him. Brian was antisocial, dangerous, and sadistic. He was looking for a sense of purpose that would reconcile these characteristics with his desire for excitement. Brian latched on to the idea that Rochelle was a victim, and he was saving her by murdering her mother, Lori. In reality, he simply wanted to kill someone. Brian kept pushing the issue with Jason. Brian was eager to move forward with the plan. He believed that he was a master criminal. During an interview, he talked about how he took various steps to confuse the police. For example, he had multiple pairs of boots, he wore layers of clothing, he scrubbed his skin to avoid leaving skin flakes behind at the crime scene, he bought bags of dust and dirt to baffle the police, and Brian gained access to the Waterman residence by reaching his hand through the cat door so there was no forced entry. I think this case illustrates how an idea can start off with little or no motivation behind it, but then it can become amplified at various stages until it is made into a reality. I think that Rochelle started everything with her homicidal idea. Jason gave that idea more energy, which led Brian to making it happen. Often, when a bad idea is introduced, it is immediately discouraged upon being transmitted. But in this case, the opposite happened. At every stage, the idea was amplified. As all this was going on, Lori was desperately trying to reconnect with her daughter. She realized that something was wrong. Lori even wrote a note to Rochelle saying that she was worried about her, loved her, and felt as though she was pulling away. She wanted to be close to her daughter. Lori probably had no idea how distant Rochelle was, how Rochelle's desires had been amplified into a homicidal reality. Those are my thoughts in the case of Rochelle Waterman. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.